I get a lot of emails, and some of them say, Professor, you're wrong. You're totally wrong. The aliens are not there. The aliens are here. They're among us. Do I feel or do I believe this is, quote, extraterrestrial? Let me be very careful before I answer that by saying, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what I think or what I believe. What matters is what the data and the facts tell us. Uh, and from that perspective, it's very important that I've, I've, I've always, I had a very simple job, and that is to collect the truth and speak the truth. Is it one of our secret technologies? And the answer is no. How do we know that? Well, for several reasons. First of all, I had access to all those programs and those type of programs. You don't typically test these type of secret aircraft in and around areas where you're doing active maneuvers. Um, you, you tend to test them at secret test ranges like Area 51. You certainly don't endanger uh, pilots' lives by testing this type of secret technology. So we very quickly realized it wasn't our technology. Now, when I was first approached by Carolyn Corey, uh, the producer of this film, A Tear in the Sky. I was skeptical. I said to myself, come on. I mean, five days? Five days you're going to look for flying saucers in the sky? So I was pleasantly surprised when they actually found something. They actually have photographic evidence of objects that can gyrate just the way the Pentagon has said. Wow, Tic Tacs. Basically. Maybe Tic Tac. Maybe. Caught on our cameras. Yep. That's incredible. Well, the Pentagon has uh, listed, I think, five different options. Uh, one option, of course, is that they're weather balloons or something that's an artifact of our space program. Maybe uh, a piece of rocket uh, that is, is plunging back into the Earth's atmosphere. Anomalous uh, weather events. Uh, they happen, and they have to be looked at very carefully. But the last option, the last option is other. One possibility for other is hypersonic drones. Mm. We see that in warfare now. The Russians in the battle of Ukraine is actually using hypersonic drones to hit targets inside Ukraine. Uh, to be hypersonic, you have to go faster than Mach 5. Anything faster than five times the speed of sound is called hypersonic. And so the Russians are now fielding hypersonic drones in warfare. But you see, this is something just in the last few months. These sightings, they go back decades into the past with objects executing these gyrations decades ago. And that's why you have to take them seriously. We're talking about objects that defy the known laws of aerodynamics with a technology beyond what we have today. Whose are these things? These objects create no sonic booms. When you exceed the sound barrier, uh, you create a gigantic boom these objects can effortlessly uh, break the sound barrier and not create a sonic boom. And they don't create any exhaust. Uh, we don't see an exhaust trail from these objects. So either they're an optical illusion of some sort, or they have a set of laws of physics beyond what we, what, what we can muster. There are really only three possibilities of what this could be. And the first possibility is that it is some sort of secret US tech that somehow uh, we have managed to keep secret even from ourselves for, for a long period of time. The second option is that it's some sort of foreign adversarial technology that has somehow managed to technologically leapfrog ahead of our country, uh, despite having a, a fairly robust and comprehensive in, in intelligence apparatus. And of course, the, the third option is, is something quite entirely different. It's, it's, a, it's a different paradigm. That is not our technology. Uh, and that's that's hugely important. And I think we're now beginning to learn, as we've heard from the director of national intelligence, and I can certainly tell you from my experience, that we're pretty confident that it's not Russian or, or Chinese technology. Uh, furthermore, if you had this type of technology, you probably wouldn't need to invest so much in military because you had this, if you will, checkmate type technology or capability where everything else now becomes obsolete. Well, if it's not our technology and it's not some sort of foreign adversarial technology, then then whose or, or what is it? What exactly are these if they're not ours? Now we have multiple sightings by multiple modes. That is the gold standard, the gold standard for looking for these objects. Not just radar, but visual sighting, infrared sensors, uh, telescopic evidence. Now we have multiple sightings by multiple modes. And so the burden of proof has shifted to the Pentagon, to the military. Now they have to prove that these aren't extraterrestrial. You know, 50 years ago, there was a congressional hearing, and it was coming out of Project Blue Book. 
And there was a lot of laughter and a lot of jokes about thing, little green men in outer space. 50 years ago, that's the way it was. Now, things have changed. Now people are looking at, looking at are they a threat militarily? What kinds of sensors do we have? What kind of metrics do we have? We now have frame by frame an analysis of these objects. These objects travel between Mach 5 and Mach 20. That's 20 times the speed of sound. These objects can zigzag and we can measure the g-force inside the, this object. The g-forces are several hundred times the force of gravity. These objects can drop 70,000 feet in a few seconds, and they can go underwater. This is something that we didn't realize before, but yes, they can actually go underwater. And they also move without creating an exhaust or breaking the sound barrier. So these are things that we can now document frame by frame looking at these videotapes. We are quite convinced that we're dealing with a technology that is, is multi-generational, uh, several, uh, several generations ahead of what we consider next generation technology. So what we would consider beyond next generation technology, something that could be anywhere between 50 to 1,000 years ahead of us. And these things have, a, uh, have a, a tendency to be seen in and around water, which, which kind of leads to one of the observables uh, that we've had. There's five distinct observables that set this technology, as I mentioned earlier, aside from everything we have in our inventory. The first is hypersonic velocity, the ability to change directions instantly. Um, and, and when I say instantly, I mean human beings can withstand about 9G forces. Uh, our, some of our best aircraft can withstand about 16Gs. These things are doing three, four, 600 Gs uh, in mid-flight. Uh, then there's hypersonic velocity. Uh, that is speeds that by definition are Mach 5 or above. Very, very fast. We do have some technology. You mentioned Russian hypersonics and things like that. You know, there, there are technologies that can go that fast, but then again, you don't expect a, a hypersonic aircraft to do a 90 degree turn. Uh, to put that into context, our SR-71 Blackbird, when at 3,200 miles an hour, wants to take a right-hand turn, it takes roughly half the state of Ohio to do it. You don't expect it to just kind of do this. Uh, and that's precisely what we're seeing. And then the third observable is a bit like cloaking. We call it low observability. But the fourth observable is what, what we were talking about, and that's transmedium travel and water. The ability for, for an object to fly not only in our atmosphere, low and high altitudes, but also potentially in a vacuum environment like space and even underwater. Now, we do have vehicles that can do that. We have, a, for example, an, uh, a seaplane. A seaplane is, is a plane that can fly and it can float on the water. But when you look at it, it's neither really a very good aircraft or a boat because it's a design compromise. And yet what we are seeing are objects that can operate in all these domains or all these environments seemingly without any type of performance compromise. And so why are we seeing these things around in and around water is something that we're really we're really kind of scratching our heads with because we've seen these things they've been recorded not only in our atmosphere but there is data to suggest that they have also been tracked by some of our our capabilities underwater as well and being able to perform in ways that frankly exceed anything that we know we are on, on the planet right now. If an object were to move in front of your eyes traveling at a very slow velocity but you don't know how far they are away, you may think that object is very far away from you, traveling at enormous velocities. So a weather balloon drifting in front of your eyes can simulate an object traveling at hypersonic velocities if you think that weather balloon is far away from you. So how do you tell the difference? Well, you look at wind patterns. It turns out that many of these sightings, these objects defy the direction of the wind. If they are weather balloons that you confuse with a flying saucer, uh, then they would be moving with the direction of the wind. But these objects do not do that. These objects can go against the direction of the wind. Not only that, but we have multiple sightings. If an object is close to you, but you think it's far away, then, it, then it's traveling at an enormous velocity while it's actually just drifting in front of your eyes. How do you tell the difference? By having multiple sensors radar, infrared sensors, visual sighting. Then you can tell how far this object is away from you, and then you can say that, nope, it's an optical illusion. And so that's why we're scratching our heads. Who has this capability? And the answer is, we don't know.
The most famous uh, case that we had was in 2004. It involved the USS Nimitz Carrier Strike Group. And there you have uh, one of the escort ships with the latest uh, Spy-1 radar capability beginning to pick up some sort of weird anomaly. And both are now looking at some sort of object, we'll call it an object, coming in from 80,000 feet and within, within less than a second, now hovering 50 feet over the water. They get vectored to, to the area, and the first thing they notice is some water roiling on, on the ocean. He describes as this white, and it's about 40 feet long. There's no windows, no, no real wings or control surfaces, no obvious signs of propulsion, and yet this object is witnessed now by four separate individuals and two separate aircraft bouncing back and forth almost like a ping pong ball right over the surface of the water. So as he goes down and, and to take a closer look at this, all of a sudden this thing begins to react. As Commander Fravor's coming in for a better look, this thing begins to maintain its distance and all of a sudden, like that, it's gone. It absolutely disappears over the horizon within, within, within about a second. Now, what's even more scary, which is in about five seconds afterwards, and this object now is picked up once again on radar 60 miles away. When you look at this video, a couple things to the trained eye you'll begin to notice. First of all uh, is the, the telemetry that you see on the screen is altitude. Now, when an aircraft banks 90 degrees, you hear what they say, wow, it, it, this is compelling and the thing is rotating. Well, not only is it rotating, but it's not losing lift. So aircraft that have wings, whenever you're gonna do a bank and you're gonna turn, when you do that, you lose lift and you lose altitude. And yet this is not losing altitude. And as you hear them say, it's going 120 knots against the wind, right? So we're going against the wind. The wind's 120 knots to the west. We're not talking about a balloon. At 25,000 feet, we're not talking about a, a quadcopter or a drone, and we're not talking about an aircraft. And if you look at that, it doesn't really look like an aircraft, does it? It looks looks peculiar, it looks almost like a, like a top. And then furthermore, what you don't see on the video, but you hear in, in, in the exasperation of the of pilots, is that there's a whole fleet of them. There's a whole fleet of them, look on the ASA. And so what's important to know here, it's sometimes not just what you see on screen, but it's the complete picture. It's sometimes it's what you don't see and also what you can hear. When you said there's a whole fleet of them, what did they look like? How were they maneuvering? What were they doing? What separates these from anything else that we have in our current inventory is quite simple. There's five observables that associate, when you look at something as a UAP, unidentified aerial phenomena, as being truly unique. That's instantaneous acceleration, hypersonic velocity, low observability, transmedium travel, the ability to operate in multiple environments or domains, and last but not least in, in the vernacular would be anti-gravity. The ability to fly with no wings, control surfaces, uh, no obvious signs of propulsion, even frankly, not even a cockpit. Whether or not these are real, this is a fact. This is, we're here, folks. Uh, the question is, what is it? Where is it from? What is its intent? Uh, and, and what can or should we be doing about it? Many of my friends, you know, they're all physicists. When you talk aliens to them, their eyes kind of like roll up into the heavens and they start to shake their heads. That's the giggle factor, that whenever you talk to them about that. And why do they giggle? They say the distance between stars is so great. It would take hundreds, thousands of years for them to reach us. But you see, that assumes they are a hundred years ahead of us. And of course, a hundred years ahead of us, a civilization like that cannot reach the earth. But for the moment, think of what could happen if they are a million years ahead of us. If they are a million years ahead of us, and our science is only 300 years old. 300 years ago, we lived in witchcraft, sorcery, magic. That's where we were 300 years ago. If they're a million years ahead of us, which is a blink of an eye, a blink of an eye because the universe is 13.8, billion years old, then think that their understanding of the laws of physics would be completely different from our understanding of the laws of physics. You see, our understanding of the laws of physics break down. Break down at the instant of creation, the Big Bang, and the center of a black hole. We don't know anything about the center of a black hole or the instant of creation. New laws of physics open up, perhaps wormholes gateways that allow us to go faster than the speed of light. 
And so get rid of all your prejudices that they can't reach us because they're, they're only 100 years ahead of us. If they're a million years ahead of us, new laws of physics begin to open up.